if you're just tuning in, uh, today's episode is really about the uh, world at large of the, the Copper Age in general. Uh, now, uh, if you are just tuning in, uh, the first episode, you might want to hop back and have a listen to it. Uh, we told the story, well, a fictionalized, a re, you know, imagining of the story of Otzi, uh, the Iceman, who was a, a Copper Age farmer, shepherd, who lived in the uh, northern Italian Alps uh, during the Copper Age, r- roughly around... Uh, 3300, 3200, you know, sometime, somewhere thereabouts uh, before Common Era. Today, we're going to start digging into the the world uh, of Otzi, the world of, of uh, really in general, and what was happening. And as we look at the big picture, you know, we, we understand the context of just the world in general. We're going to start zeroing in. Um, you know, if you can imagine, uh, you know, Google Earth, we've got a nice big, uh, we're, we're sitting in the atmosphere and we see the entire Earth. Uh, and as this podcast series continues, we're going to start zooming in, zooming in, zooming in until we're sitting uh, in a... Uh, uh, a, a hut of a farmer in Copper Age Anatolia, and we'll talk about their life. But before we get there, we're going to start in that big zoomed out picture. So, you know, in, in general, water levels more or less the same uh, as to what they were. Um, now, there was a big warming event a few thousand years earlier. Um, and um, there has been some sea level rise way back in the, so far back in the past to human humans that live now and when I say now I'm talking about 3,000 before common era 4,000 before common era um, that warming that sea level rise was so long ago um, it's ancient history uh, it's not in their memory except as maybe some some story that somebody tells of a mythological uh, hero or uh, you know a, a, a morality tale or part of the religious structure um, that's the type of memory that we're talking about the time scale of, of how these people might have even have some recollection of that so there are glaciers forming um, now, uh, during this time, there's uh, very little methane in the atmosphere, uh, so that's a bit of a cooling, uh, and we'll see, uh, well, not we'll see, uh, some sea level drop, not very noticeable, uh, but what it does really translate into is some cooler temperatures, um, drier um, air in general, and uh, you know, one of those things that's happening that's that's actually pretty significant. You know, if we're we're at the the start of our Copper Age period, and, and when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about 4,000 before Common Era. Uh, the uh, the the Saharan Desert at this time would more accurately be called the Saharan Serengeti, the Saharan Savanna. It's green at this time. It's at the tail end uh, of of what we would call the green Sahara. Uh, And there's a uh, 20,000 year repeating cycle all through time of the Sahara becoming a desert uh, and then becoming, uh, uh, pardon me, a uh, savanna, you know, with grasslands and lakes everywhere and then going back to desert again and so on so every 20,000 years this is happening and at 4,000 BC before common era we're right at the tail end of the wet period it's just starting to dry up Uh, there hasn't been rain significant rain uh, for probably a few hundred years now uh, and that's causing noticeable problems and when I say noticeable problems I mean there are massive massive lakes in 
Africa at this time. Um, you know, when we think about our Great Lakes uh, uh, being in Canada, um, you know, we've got Lake Huron, Lake Superior. Um, there is a, uh, a lake in Africa in uh, around the uh, Sahara at this time, kind of at the bottom end of it, called Lake Chad. And, uh, you know, Lake Chad is the Chad of lakes at this time because it's actually called Mega Chad Lake. Uh, if, if you want to look it up on Wikipedia, you can take a look at Mega Chad Lake uh, in, you know, uh, 4000, 6000 BC. And, and it's drying up. The water levels have dropped quite a bit in the last, um, you know, 100 years or so. Um, but that gives you an idea of, you know, in your head, maybe how big this thing is that we've got a Chad Lake that's so big we're calling it Mega Chad Lake. Also happening at well just having recently happened uh, would be England uh, recently became an island uh, and I say recently that's recently within the geologic time scale uh, it's happened um, semi quickly over uh, you know a thousand year period or so uh, we had kind of two events uh, happened um, in around that formed the North Sea um, the North Sea at uh, you know uh, in 6,000 so really just 2,000 years ago 1,000 years ago uh, the North Sea was really a, a giant plains area uh, lots of lakes uh, maybe some marshland um, but mostly just kind of lakes and fields and, and there was uh, quite a, a significant amount of human civilization lived in that area uh, and as the glaciers started melting uh, you know in 6000 BC uh, there was flooding and, and we're not talking about um, you know the Bible level biblical flooding of we're seeing um, meters rise uh, of sea level per second that's not happening um, but it is meters per year uh, of rise uh, in and around the North Sea area at the time it's called Dogger land and you can take a look on that if you want to if you want to have uh, an interesting read um, but two big events are happening one uh, the the uh, the warming at the time is melting ice and glaciers everywhere so we have glacier retreat all that water is getting released and dogger land is becoming the north sea uh, and as that happens um, kind of higher areas in dogger land are becoming uh, archipelagos and larger islands the lowlands are flooding uh, people are having to uh, abandon their farms, their villages, and moving away from that uh, into, you know, Finland, Sweden, that area, or into northern France, uh, Belgium areas, uh, and then moving into, into what will be England. The second big event that happens there is there is uh, three massive um, undersea landslides that happened in the North Sea after the flooding period happened uh, and that caused three massive tsunamis probably what they think is the largest tsunamis in recorded history uh, that we can find evidence of at least um, so those tsunamis uh, that really did the the last of the effort of creating what we think of as the North Sea uh, and the island of England at that time. So that happened just just you know a thousand years or, or so earlier than the time period we're in today. In terms of humanity in general, we have uh, really kind of the earliest city-states or, or even cities forming. Um, our ability to farm and domesticate animals has uh, increased significantly enough that we're able to have really larger than a, than a village. Um, and we're able to uh, have in certain areas anyways where, where we've got the just perfect conditions, uh, we're able to form uh, small cities. 
and, and we've got a few of those happening really independently all around the world. Um, parts of northern India, uh, what we would call the Pontic Steppes, which is, if you can think of the Black Sea, the northern area of that, uh, and parts of Eastern Europe. Um, well, that's what we would call the Pontic Steppes. Um, there's significant Copper Age cities starting there. As well, we've got parts of Central and Southern uh, America um, very rich farmland there and the uh, human civilizations that are in all North, Central and South America, those are the two spots where we're, we're seeing early cities form uh, and the organization that's required to run a city-state, uh, that's happening in those areas. In terms uh, of, of also, <laughs> we've got the area of, you know, Turkey uh, and the the Near East. So uh, we're, the areas that we think of today as, as the Middle and Near East. So, um, you know, um, the Eastern Mediterranean areas. So that's the, the parts of uh, Turkey uh, and Lebanon and, and uh, what's today Israel uh, and Northern Egypt. Um, the Sinai uh, Peninsula area, um, all those areas, there's city-states forming there, and we'll, we'll be touching on those as we zoom into Anatolia, uh, because um, that's really where uh, a lot of us um, who think about the rise of civilization, that's where most of us think civilization started. Uh, that's not true. It started in a lot of places all around the world, basically at the same time and in China as well we're seeing the first city-states forming there uh, also roughly the same uh, time you know between 4,000 before common era and 3,000 before common era it's basically happening all, all over the world and it's not really happening in a vacuum uh, you know outside these areas there's still lots and lots of humans lots and lots of human civilization you know, when, when we were in school, we were taught that, um, you know, the, the, there's little bands of humanity and they just pop up all of a sudden in Mesopotamia, in Egypt. Um, and, you know, that, that's fine if you're, um, you know, a, an eight-year-old learning about history or you're in junior high understanding the rise of Western civilization, uh, that sort of thing. But if you scratch, if you pull on that thread at all, it really unravels. Uh, the reality is uh, humankind is has by now all over the world. Uh, and we were what we would think of as hunter-gatherers. Uh, and when you think about hunter-gatherers, you know, we may think of um, kind of roaming Conan the Barbarian type people. Um, some of you may think that, some of you may not, uh, but probably, not probably, uh, very likely uh, the closest you can think of that is really uh, the First Nations people of uh, North uh, North America. When, when we first encountered them in the uh, 1600s, um, you know, when you can think of uh, large tribal communities, um, mobile civilizations that can um, pack up all their gear, move when they need to, to another area that's rich in hunting grounds, uh, stay there for a while, pack up again, move to another area that's rich in hunting grounds. Uh, well, that's really been um, the way humanity functioned for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and that's still happening in large parts 
of Europe uh, and Central and South America, uh, in uh, the Mid and Far East, in Asia, it's really still happening. Uh, but in amongst all this, the, the kind of wandering uh, tribal hunter-gatherer people uh, that, that kind of pick up and follow their food or, or, or move with the seasons, there's still farming happening really everywhere. So there are communities, even um, you know, 6,000 before Common Era, 8,000 before common era when we think about the paleolithic stone age people those people are still farming now there's uh, a small small minority of that farming happening um, you know 8,000 6,000 before common era uh, but slowly as technology improves as the environment improves and as people find the right areas uh, and uh, you know, as we selectively breed crops, we get more and more farming. More and more sedentary people are sitting down. We're, we're building villages here and there and there and there. And that's happening everywhere independently. And in and amongst all of this, there's trade. And I know, you know, when we think uh, about trade, um, you know, we may think about the movement of goods from, from, uh, you know, North America to, to Asia, vice versa. Uh, but and it's hard in our heads to wrap our minds around the concept that somebody who doesn't even have a horse can get copper mined in the Italian Alps all the way to England. But that happens. That happens uh, in three and 4,000 before Common Era. There are trade networks that we know exist. Uh, and we know they exist because we find um, through whatever scientific um, uh, methods are out there to test and be able to say this piece of copper came from Italy, uh, whereas this one came from India. Um, but that knowledge exists today. Uh, and, and, and when we analyze the metals and gemstones um, that we find in one uh, prehistoric site, it really shocks us when we first getting into that. Um, to find when you think uh, in, in eastern Wales or in eastern Cornwall uh, where there's a, a you know rich tin mines that some people there had copper from Italy and tin from those places winds up in Europe so that's pretty cool when you think um, about all this happening and, and some of the other things that's happening to enable this type of trade even though we haven't even figured out a horse and saddle or a chariot or a bridle to domesticate an animal enough to allow it to pull um, any real load what we have we do have the wheel we know we have the wheel. We, we've seen evidence uh, of wheels um, from about, I think, about 5,000, 6,000 before Common Era. And, and we know we have wagons. So we have people pulling this stuff, pushing this stuff on carts from one area to another. Probably not one big trip, probably goes to, um, you know, when we think about trade today, you mine your, your copper in one area and, and you take it to the village to the north because there's a person there who comes once a year and they'll buy uh, your copper off you uh, for some chickens or for some tin or for uh, some precious stones 
amber, for example. So that's the the interconnectedness of um, the Copper Age world that exists, uh, and it's um, across Europe, and it's from uh, the edges of Europe into the Middle East, and it's from the Middle East into Asia, and it's from uh, Asia, India, into um, the the South China Sea, that area, and it's from there uh, into Russia, a and from Russia, it comes back again. So we've got a um, a nice big circular pump of goods, kind of moving around. And though uh, somebody in England probably has no idea what somebody uh, in the Italian Alps looks like or sounds like or talks, um, there's probably 10 or 20 stops in between of little villages that are little hubs where, where people um, are, are meeting up and trading goods. And that's kind of cool when you think about uh, even back then, before we had horses domesticated, uh, before we had a bridle, that we were, uh, we had enough food, enough security in our in our local villages and communities that we could produce extra goods that we didn't need, take that uh, a week's travel to somewhere else and trade for goods there that we did need and bring it back. We had uh, enough food security, uh, enough wealth, enough surplus population to be able to uh, to have this kind of trade uh, network even back then. And when you have trade, you have the sharing of cultures, of ideas, of how things are done, of art, of religion, of language. And so, you know, if, if you do uh, any sort of research into Copper Age civilization, you're going to see maps that, that cover massive chunks of Europe or Asia, and, and they talk about, um, you know, Yamnaya culture or uh, funnel beaker culture or linear pottery A culture. Uh, and when they say culture, they, that's the best they can tell is that the groups of people in this massive area uh, shared the same techniques for making pottery. Or uh, the shape of bricks um, that they made to build their houses was the same. Um, the outline of their villages was the same. So we can tell at least uh, that there's a sharing of technology and how things are done across massive chunks of Europe and Asia um, and the Middle East. But it's probably, you know, when you think today, not likely everybody sp spoke the language over that massive an area. You know, if you think today, um, you know, you travel, um, you know, 200 kilometers north, south, east, or west, and somebody there um, speaks with a different accent, even though you're speaking the same language. Now, what would that be like 6,000 years ago before uh, there were even horses to travel back and forth and have everybody speaking together? Everybody every community exists in a vacuum except for the group of people that maybe go once a year um, a week's ride or walk north south east west whatever to the trading hub 
so in my mind uh, I like to think of it as we've, we've got a lot of um, little communities we probably speak similar dialects or, or similar root languages but our accents are probably so thick that unless you're the person who's traveling there once a year you're, you're probably not going to pick it up you know it's probably uh, you know if you think someone um, who speaks Acadian French in New Orleans in the United States in Louisiana uh, traveling to France and then trying to speak French to them well they'd probably look at you like you had your head screwed on backwards there would be some words that are kind of similar but it would certainly sound really weird you probably uh, they might think you're a freak a and if you sat together for an hour you could probably figure some things out but at the very least if you repeat this process all the time you probably are, are able to get words enough together that you can build your kind of trade language um, you know common root words for um, you know uh, one circlet of copper equals uh, a, a bag of grain and while we have these goods trading back and forth we've got somebody producing uh, pottery that's got a linear design around it that somebody in another village had no idea you could do their pottery is just flat and boring but it works but then they see this other pottery that somebody's got that's got these nifty little linear designs around it well that's pretty cool I'm gonna trade my chicken um, for that and I'm gonna take that back to our local potter we've got in the village uh, and I'm gonna show it to that guy and he's gonna be able to figure out how to make uh, that cool design in his pottery uh, and then we're gonna have access to that more uh, advanced technology that more advanced way of making it um, so when you do look on those maps and, and you see the linear pottery a culture you see the Yamnaya cultures you see the Kurgan cultures in my mind that's what that's about it, it, it's representative of uh, trade networks in large groups of small communities and when I say large groups I mean groups of communities that cover a large area that are trading enough together that they're starting to adopt each other's technologies cultural expropriation if you want to think about it that way hey that sounds kind of cool I like that name I'm gonna name my kid that or I like that way you're making pottery I'm gonna steal that for myself or shit the way you build that home well that's pretty awesome I never in a thousand years would have thought to build my house that way kind of makes sense to put a chimney over my fire pit maybe I'll start doing that now that way I don't have to keep the windows open all the time that's the world that we're trying to build here is a world that's probably well not probably a world that is definitely more connected than you think it is a world where language is sh being shared um, even though everybody's existing in their little vacuum communities there are groups of people that are traveling from one community to another trading goods trading ideas and language exchange naturally happens when that thing happens now when we think about that world of travel it's a lot like our world today I like to think that people are people and it doesn't matter if it's um, somebody from 
2,000 years in the future, or 3,000 years in our past, or 4,000 years in our past, or 100,000 years in our past, our same motivations always rule us. It's just how we act on them that changes. And, you know, there are people out there today that if they see something they like, well, they're just going to take it. And we have structures in place today to keep that from happening. Or if it does happen, um, to find some way to exact some measure of revenge on that person. We call it justice today. It was revenge back then. And we had police today. And back then, you had the guy in the village um, that was the 300-pound gorilla with an axe. He was your cop. He was your sheriff. And, and he may have been your lord. He may have been the person everybody in the village deferred to. He may have been a uh, person that was um, voted most likely to be able to kick ass. He may have been the person uh, that just nobody can stop. So he does what he wants. Uh, and if you come into his village and want to take his stuff, well, you got to start deal with him first. That's law back then. And so if you're uh, one of these groups of people taking your hard mined tin or copper or amber or pottery or uh, excess food that you're not going to need for the winter to your local trading hub and you've got a week's travel, well, you want the 300-pound gorilla with an axe with you. You maybe want a couple of them on your side. And that guy, he's going to have some kind of armor. He's got um, maybe leather armor, maybe thick furs, not much more than that at this time. But he's got an axe, he's got a spear, he's got a bow and arrow. Uh, he's got a club. That's what we're thinking about at this time. Metal is extremely precious. So swords um, are extraordinarily rare. You might call it a dagger. Stone is still a very valid um, thing you might see on a field of battle. Stone axe, stone tip spears, uh, stone arrows, stone um, uh, wrapped around uh, uh, as the club head. Uh, and that guy is the guy that's guarding your caravan, your trade group. And that guy is also the guy that's taking your stuff. So this is um, what what exists for law and order. Um, your mortal fear of your life, the 300-pound gorilla with the spear and the axe that nobody wants to mess with. And while we're on the topic of trade and of um, you know law and order or, or, or what would pass for that back then we might be thinking of you know the the first civilizations you know I talked earlier about city-states starting to pop up well uh, we're when you think of the first significant 
civilizations. If you've at all been the person educated in, uh, in Europe or in North America, you were probably taught, um, you know, the ancient Mesopotamians and, and ancient Egyptians were probably uh, amongst the first significant cultures that formed at that time. Well, at this time, the time that I'm talking about, Egypt's um, a, a distant um, dream of the first kings in, at the edge of the Isle, of Nile. Sorry. Uh, as the Sahara is drying out, the people um, in the northern areas of that uh, they're getting pushed out of that because, well, there, there's sand everywhere. There's less water. Uh, there's less areas to farm. There's less animals to hunt. But the Nile Valley, the Nile Delta, um, that area is pretty good for farming. Uh, and there's already been a farming civilization there for thousands of years before um, the first kings of Egypt are moving in. Uh, but that's starting up at this time. And, and Mesopotamia uh, and Assyria and, and those areas, uh, they're starting up at that time. And we're going to dig into that a little deeper. Uh, because that plays a key part in how Anatolia forms in the Copper Age. Uh, but there's another culture and another civilization at this time uh, that's richer uh, than anything else in the entire world put together. And that culture, that civilization is called Varna, V-A-R-N-A. And that's not too far from Anatolia. Now, Anatolia is an area of Turkey. It's pretty huge. Um, you know, it goes from uh, the, the Mediterranean area of Turkey uh, and, and along the mountains. And it borders um, northern Mesopotamia. Uh, and then it goes all the way up straight to the Black Sea. It's a huge area of land. Well, uh, if you were to visualize, you know, where Constantinople uh, is, uh, Istanbul, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, you know, just to the east of that, that's Anatolia. And if you were to travel along the Black Sea coast northeast, follow the coastline, uh, you're going to go up into uh, Bulgaria, uh, and then uh, uh, just before you get to Romania, uh, there's an area there called Varna. Uh, and that's where uh, the civilization uh, existed, is in that area of the Black Sea, uh, right around the coast, so so kind of Bulgaria, Romania uh, border uh, spot is where where we're talking about here. And this culture that's here, this Varna culture, has more gold than the entire rest of the world combined at this moment. These are the big daddies of the game. We only hear about how great Mesopotamia uh, and Egypt and those civilizations are uh, because we've been doing archaeological digs in that area since the 1800s. We have not been doing archaeological digs in Ukraine and in Bulgaria and in those areas around there uh, until really uh, the modern times, until um, really past the Cold War era of the 1980s. And so as we uh, get investment and, and get uh, time to dig down there, we're discovering uh, civilizations that we didn't know existed. And we're discovering um, uh, 
how much more advanced they were than even Egypt or Mesopotamia was at the same period of time. Like I said, they had more gold in their treasury than the entire rest of the world combined at this time. That's how rich these people were. Now, if you remember back uh, to your uh, school education when we were talking about uh, Mesopotamia uh, and Assyria and Egypt and, and how big they were, well, like I said, they're just um, little itty-bitty cities at this time. And the Varna, the Varna are pulling in goods from as far away as Greece. They're pulling in copper from the mountains of uh, the Carpathian area, gold from the same area. Salt is being mined um, just about 100 kilometers away. Flint and graphite stones uh, made for tools also hundreds of kilometers away uh, so they've got a reach that goes basically from southeastern ukraine all the way into greece and as i said they've got more gold than the entirety of the human race at this time this is how powerful these people were they're so powerful uh, copper is, is widespread use now it's not for everybody uh, but there's a lot of copper there copper tools copper weapons uh, copper axe heads um, attached to polished metal um, shafts probably just for the elite of the elite but stone and flint tools still heavily used. Uh, bone and antler tools, decorations heavily used. But this culture um, was massive. Uh, and um, it, we're just learning about them now. Now what happened to the Varna people is not really uh, well known um, you know it's still very early days of taking a look at them um, other people are gonna write lots of papers about that uh, but the best guest we've got today is a combination of things that uh, there was flooding uh, in the valley area around the Black Sea where most of the Varna settlements were um, and also there's a lot of evidence about 600 so of these uh, settlements being burned and destroyed um, so that kind of makes you think uh, that there was some warfare happened and uh, uh, Varna got the wrong end of that deal like I was talking about earlier the 300 pound gorilla with the axe you want him on your side Now back closer to uh, home, home being Anatolia. On the other side of Anatolia is the rise of Mesopotamia and, and those areas around them. Now the area that we're talking about uh, right now is the area of the uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, which you know typically we would refer to that area as what's called the Levant um, which is uh, the area from uh, southern uh, Mediterranean so uh, the area that would really just kind of border what you think of as Egypt that's uh, called the Sinai Peninsula uh, so from that area if we go along the coastline of the Mediterranean to the north uh, we go through uh, what's now uh, uh, Israel Lebanon, uh, Syria, uh, that's the Levant. And, and that all borders Anatolia. Uh, so this Levant uh, area, 
that borders what we would think of as modern day Iraq. And of course, next to them is Iran. And these are the areas that we're traditionally thought of as the starting of civilization. Uh, and like I said, um, we had a whole other civilization um, a thousand years earlier uh, that had more gold than the entire rest of the world combined, uh, and they were just uh, a few hundred kilometers to the northeast. Uh, now, uh, this area, the Levant, uh, becomes, at this time, uh, not quite Mesopotamia. Uh, we would call it uh, what's called the Uruk period. And uh, this is really made up of uh, a bunch of small uh, little cities. And, and we all know the story. The, these little villages, uh, they've been around really for 10,000 years, um, farming communities. Um, but like I said, um, you know, environments change, the weather improves, technology improves, trade improves and, and that lets uh, some of these people uh, get ambitious and so we have uh, a couple of cities that that are starting to form in uh, what we would think of as the as the gulf um, between the, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Um, now this time, this area, you know, modern day, uh, it's kind of a deserty, dry spot, but during this time period, it's beautiful farmland. Um, much like the Nile, it floods regularly. The farmland is rich from the soil flooding and that enables a lot of extra food, uh, a lot of extra time on people's hands, and, and extra population to spend as warriors conquering your neighbors. So in this time, um, we see uh, the, the first cities that we're aware of that we actually have recorded, written down history of. And these cities, uh, they're called Ur, they're called Uruk, uh, they're called Enkidu, and Nippur. And these cities are, like I said, between the Tigris and the Euphrates. They're just around the Gulf Coast area, um, which is the, the southeastern area of uh, Iraq. Still a long ways away from Anatolia. Uh, but remember, we're talking about the, that trade network of people that move back and forth. And when we're talking about the trade network, the people that share cultural ideas, well, these people in this area, uh, they learn how to smelt copper from the people that live in Anatolia. That's right, uh, the, the place that we think of as the rise of civilization uh, learned a lot of its civilization from the people that lived in Anatolia. Now these people, they form uh, what we call city-states, uh, which is really, if you think about it, you know, um, you know I live in the city of Halifax in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. If we think that uh, the town council of Halifax uh, got together and Canada didn't exist yet, and the town council of Halifax uh, is run by uh, the mayor, uh, but in this time, let's call him our chief. And our chief has a lot of extra bodies um, that don't need to be farming because it's not farming season. You know, the crops have already been planted. They're doing their own thing. Uh, we've got a lot of bodies sitting around doing nothing. You've got a great idea. That idea is let's take all these people, this few thousand population that we've got, We've already planted our crops. That's the hard work for the year uh, until uh, we need to harvest. And it's not too hot right now. It's not too cold. The crops are going to grow themselves. 
and, and I'm in the city of Halifax and uh, uh, you know the city of Dartmouth which is just across the river well uh, all those people uh, they're sitting around doing nothing maybe I have the smart idea or maybe it's not smart maybe it's the asshole idea uh, that I'm going to conquer Dartmouth with all all my farmers that are sitting around doing nothing right now Dartmouth doesn't know it uh, so I get together I have enough money I have enough extra copper uh, laying around um, and I have enough artisans laying around that we can start uh, hammering out we can start hammering out copper weapons uh, copper armor uh, we may even see some bronze at this time uh, copper spears uh, we may even see uh, some swords uh, there's some evidence that we can see uh, swords being used uh, around this time uh, and in and around this area um, you know around the uh, Mesopotamian and the uh, Anatolian um, uh, region which is you know that's the area we're at today um, so swords um, not really what you think of when you think about swords They're about two feet long um, may, maybe smaller you could think of them more as uh, extra long daggers uh, again metal still pretty precious so um, you know that's what you get um, short range stabbing weapons uh, and then you'd have spears, which is really the longer range stabbing weapons. And we don't have too much evidence for how they fought at this time. You know, if we fast forward a few hundred years, um, we have a good idea of actually how they're fighting because there's um, evidence of it on their art, on their ceramics uh, written down. Uh, but we're in the uh, kind of pre-writing period uh, there is some uh, art but it's not really um, informative about what we're talking about um, so if we go by uh, you know how they're fighting a few hundred years later we can guess that they probably uh, mostly form up in phalanxes you know groups of guys shoulder to shoulder uh, multiple people deep everybody's got uh, a spear and a shield uh, and then the guy behind him has a spear and a shield and so on and so on and then there's probably another group of people maybe you know a hundred strong units uh, and uh, instead of spears those guys have the two-foot swords and some of these swords will be straight some of them uh, might have uh, a little sickle shape in them And then we have slings, uh, the archers, the missile units. Uh, like I said, archery is um, um, you know, popular and common, and bow and arrow is excellent uh, weapon, uh, but it's hard to do it uh, if you want to make uh, you know, 2,000 arrows today, collect them all. Um, you know maybe some of it's gonna break you're gonna get 2,000 arrowheads uh, that's a lot of work so sling stones and slings is the industrial technology it's the industrial weapon system that's being developed at this time uh, arrows we can do a little bit of but slings and sling stones are a lot easier to make if we're talking about arming uh, uh, thousands of people and when we make sling stones at this time uh, we're not going around and um, you know going to the water edge and finding nice shiny stones that would be good for slings no we need thousands of them if we're going to uh, start a war with our neighboring city so we take our pottery we've got a lot of extra uh, clay laying around and, and then we just uh, make thousands of clay stones 
You can make hundreds in an hour. Just take some stone, some clay, ball it up into a, a, a little, uh, you know, rock half the size of my fist, uh, a clay rock. Set it down in the sun to dry. After it dries, um, you know, if I've got time, if I'm pre prepping, I'm going to fire it in the kiln. And then I've got thousands of clay missiles uh, that have been built in just a matter of days. Now, if you think uh, back to my story of Otzi, who was trying the best he could with his one good arrow and failed, well, it's because it takes a lot of time to make an arrow. It takes no time at all to make a clay stone. You don't need any skill to make a clay stone. You don't need birds. You don't need any specific wood. Um, you don't need feathers. Uh, you don't need to spend uh, an hour chipping out an arrowhead. You don't need to find resin to stick that arrow in the bow, or, or pardon me, in the arrow, uh, end of the arrow tip. You don't need to wrap it in any leather. That's a lot of work for an arrow. If I'm going to think about war, I need to get industrial with this. You run out of arrows in 30 seconds. In a day, you can have a thousand sling stones. So we have slings and we have sling stones. We've got a lot of clay. It's low skill. A sling is really just a piece of leather with a pocket at the end, and it doesn't take a lot of effort if I've got 500 guys all lined up uh, and they're just raining uh, sling stones traveling at 200 kilometers an hour at your head. You don't need to aim. You just need to hail it down. That's what's happening at this time is somebody in the city of uh, Uruk, he got uh, that idea in his head. So uh, after our crops have been planted, we have the war season. And in the war season, we, we have our farmers and we have them armed with slings. And, and we have uh, shields made of hide. And we have a couple of shields, maybe made with um, leather and wood. And, and our, our, our few higher ups, our nobles, um, they're rich enough. They've probably got some metal. So they, they've got uh, maybe a metal shield. They've got, uh, if they're lucky, a metal helmet. They've got a metal spear. And people find out pretty quick when you start doing this that spears and slings is really all you need uh, when uh, the other person isn't prepared at all. So these cities, uh, they start fighting each other. And once one person becomes dominant, you know, he goes to the, the, the other city. Hey, you remember what I did to the city of Nippur? Yeah, I, I murdered half the population. I enslaved half the remaining population. Uh, and then the leader of the city, well, I took all his wife, wives, and I took all his daughters, and I made them my slaves, and I paraded them around in front of them. And you know what happens to slaves? Well, that can happen to your city next. Or you pay me and I go away. You pay me tribute every year. And that tributes a portion of your harvest. 
and it's uh, whatever valuables that are in your area. Maybe you've got access to a salt mine. Maybe you've got access to copper. Maybe you've got access to um, precious gemstones or seashells or pearls. Whatever you have of value, that's mine now. Remember earlier when I was talking about the 300 pound gorilla with the axe in Northern Europe guarding your caravan? Well, this guy uh, who's in our city, he's got 2,000 300 pound gorillas. And they're armed with slings that he's making on an industrial scale and spears made on an industrial scale. And when he's done with your city, when he's done enslaving your population, murdering half of them, taking everything of worth, well, you're left way too weak to possibly defend yourself. So when he comes next year, you have no choice. You can't even put up a fight. Half your population's been dead, murdered, or enslaved. Who you have left has to farm or you're going to starve and die so you don't have a choice you give him whatever he asks for and now you're part of uh, what's becoming the first uh, nations now that happens violently for some of these cities some of these other cities uh, you may come to with your army after the uh, after the seeds have been planted and your farms next year after you've done this two or three years well you may just proactively go to the city of Uruk and its chief and say hey 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 you don't need to come over here and enslave uh, half my city murder my other half you don't need to take my sons and daughters as slaves we don't need to go through all that I know you can beat me and, and I need to do whatever I can to protect the city to protect my family so I'm just gonna sign a treaty with you and we're gonna agree right now uh, that I'm gonna give you uh, some slaves every year I I get to pick the slaves though so I'm just gonna bring them no hassle you don't need to go through the trouble of uh, risking the lives of your guys and, and getting into fight maybe you lose a few hundred before you beat us uh, we're gonna save you that uh, you don't have to lose those few hundred and instead I'm just gonna bring you some slaves every year along with some of our harvest and, and some of our precious uh, metals that we get to uh, go from our, our mine from our local area that probably happened too And then, uh, the, you know, the obvious also happens. They may get a couple other cities that are uh, a little further away. You know, the city of Susa and, and the city uh, of, of Rubidia. They look and saw what happened to Nippur uh, and Uruk and Inkadu. And they said, Jesus. Well, they didn't say Jesus, uh, but they said something. You know, there's a problem here. Neither one of us is big enough on our own to take on this city. But if you and I work together, well, we're big enough, we might just be able to take them. And we know, because every year he's gone a little further north, we know he's coming to us next year. We've got a full year to prepare. So let's get together and prepare. And so you come to an agreement with your neighbor city, an alliance. And the two of you pool your resources to crank out the industrial level of tools and weapons and armor you need to defend yourself. And then after that year is done, 
after the crops are planted next year and the war season starts, will you go out to field of battle and you go and meet him and you tell him to fuck off? Well, that'd be a big fight, wouldn't it? Maybe uh, maybe uh, 3,000 more people would die before people started running. Maybe there was no fight at all. Maybe he just backed off and said, you know, uh, I'll come back another time. That's how warfare happened back then. When we had the first inklings of what it was like um, when you had enough people sitting around that there was too much free time, um, the idle hand is the devil's playthings. When you don't have to struggle every day to survive, you can build art or you can build war. That's what's happening in these first city-states uh, in the Levant and Mesopotamia area. They're doing a little bit of both. So this is the area of um, the Middle East and the Levant at this time. It's an area that there is periodic warfare and there is literally a season of war and that season of war lasts from after you've planted your crops till before you have to harvest them and during that time roads are being built because you got to move your armies and goods are coming back and forth and slavery's starting to become uh, a big thing because what do you do um, when you've conquered a city well they want gonna want revenge you don't want them to come back to you next year uh, you want to leave them in a handicapped state so that when next year comes around you don't have to fight them they don't stand a chance so in order to do that you can either murder everybody which is fine if you uh, don't want to come back and uh, draw from your piggy bank again next year but if you want to draw from your piggy bank next year you want to leave them still around just uh, not able to defend themselves so after you fight that first battle you take uh, you know most of the able-bodied people as slaves back to your city and then you have them work your fields so that you have more bodies to have a bigger army and they have less bodies to defend themselves so when you show up next year with a bigger army that you don't have to fight you don't have to lose anybody you just take their food take their stuff take some more slaves and then when you go on to the next city well you're already up on the game they've only got a city's worth of people to defend themselves with you've got two cities worth of people because two cities are growing food for your one city which enables you to have more people this is the calculus that's driving this area of the world at this time this is the start of what we've learned as civilization now in this time uh, we don't really have any writing happening 
uh, not that we found or, or that we can decipher in any meaningful way. Like I said, Egypt is in a similar state at this time. Um, they're just not even uh, pharaohs yet. Or if they are a pharaoh, uh, it's the pharaoh of your local uh, city fighting the pharaoh of his neighboring city for uh, a few hundred acres of land and some slaves uh, and the resources that are on that land. That's happening in uh, Mesopotamia and this area. And, and I say Mesopotamia, the Mesopotamians um, don't even really exist as a civilization yet. Uh, this is called uh, the Uruk period or the Uruk expansion. Uh, it's U-R-U-K. It's named after one of the largest cities in that area, uh, the one that we're uh, pretty sure dominated all the other ones in that period. And uh, aside from being farmers uh, and um, being great at early warfare, uh, they were also uh, amazing uh, scientists and craftsmen. Now uh, they, uh, their number, uh, you, know, you know, our numbering system is based on base 10 called the decimal system. Uh, their numbering system was uh, base 60. Um, and that's where uh, we get uh, the 60 minute hour that's where we get 360 degrees in a circle. This is where algebra first comes uh, about. You know, we're, we're starting uh, some advanced mathematics here. And, and they need it uh, because the buildings that they're constructing are massive. They're on a scale uh, that's never been seen anywhere else on the planet at this time. They're building temples that are stories tall. Uh, now if you want uh, an idea of uh, what these temples might look like, do a search for uh, the Uruk White Temple or white ziggurat and you'll find uh, some pictures of the site today uh, but also what they think it looked like um, in uh, 3500 BCE so it, it just would have been completely awe-inspiring now if you want to uh, imagine what this temple looked like uh, first, you got to understand the city of Uruk, uh, it was on a plains, um, so a large, massive, flat area surrounded by walls, because uh, of course this is a military period, and over the tops of the walls you would see this temple. Uh, so however big the walls were, you very likely still saw this temple and you'd see it uh, from way e in the distance before you even got to the city. And the top of this temple, um, it's a large uh, kind of rectangular uh, white building, two stories, give or take. And as you uh, approach the city, you see this temple growing out of the distance, right over the walls. And as you keep walking towards it, you can imagine the throngs of people waiting to come into the city, waiting to give their tribute to the king, to do trade. And as you go in through the city, you're following you know, the throngs of people. And anywhere you are, you can look up and you can see this temple dominating the landscape. And as you uh, kind of approach the temple area, what you'll see is a massive um, sloped walled 
plateau, even within the city. So uh, the temple, you know, the city is on a flat plains area and built on this flat plains area within the city walls is a giant plateau with sloped walls. Uh, so the only way you're you're getting up to the temple is uh, you've got to basically line up and uh, walk through the de you know the the built stairwell, make your way uh, around the plateau as you work your way up there, you know make you feel suitably humble, and once you got to the top of that plateau you'd be able to look around and see the entire city and look over the city walls and see the entire plains uh, which is basically the entire world to these people at this point point. and on top of that plateau is the white temple to the sky god Anu who was the god of the city for the Uruk people so you can just imagine how mind-blowingly uh, awe-inspiring and impressive that would have been. Now to build something like that, uh, you need uh, a, a lot of math. You need uh, extremely advanced engineering skills and you need a large labor force and you need a large food source to feed that labor source and the only way that can happen is through that warfare that i was talking about just a little while ago where you have your other little satellite cities that you've dominated stolen uh, their population as slaves and every year they have to give you tribute in order for you to not wipe them out. So you can take their food, their tribute, their resources, and you use the slaves and your expertise and your engineering skills and your math. And you can build structures that are awe-inspiring from hundreds of kilometers away. Well, not hundreds of kilometers away, but hours distance walking away. You would be legendary. This is the power of the civilizations that are starting to form uh, in this time period that we're talking about. Now, like I said, Egypt is just starting to come about. The, the uh, civilization that we know as Babylon, uh, that doesn't quite exist yet. We can call it maybe pre-Babylonian. There's certainly a city there, maybe a village at this time, uh, but it's not a major power. It's not even close to a major power. The Assyrians, who are nightmarishly terrifying people uh, I'll tell you you want to talk about uh, grim dark and hardcore uh, do a little reading on what the Syrian kings did to their enemies I'm not going to go into that here um, that's getting off the trail from our goal of reaching uh, Anatolia and our uh, early God Emperor of mankind as a child uh, but he'll have definitely lived through uh, the Assyrian period, and uh, maybe we'll touch on that a little bit. But this is that world. We have city-states that are dominating their peripheral city-states. They're becoming client cities that owe fealty and allegiance to a central authority call him a king and those alliances are uh, collapsing breaking down 
reforming um, all through this period. You know, a, a couple of bad harvests in one area and, and a civilization, well, the start of one, uh, you know, a city-state, um, they could collapse. Uh, one day of bad warfare uh, and uh, you lose all your slaves, you lose your fighting population, and uh, the other city-state that sees the big boy in the block get a black eye, well, he might take the opportunity to come and uh, rub your nose in it and take your stuff. So uh, walls and walled cities, they're starting to become a thing in this area of the world. Warfare uh, and the realities of what's becoming large-scale warfare of actual armies, uh, that's forcing the evolution of city design and uh, uh, warfare technology, weapon systems. You see the evolution of the sling as a preferred means of combat over a bow and arrow. A bow and arrow is great for hunting, but if you want to kill uh, a thousand people tomorrow uh, and then fight another battle where you got to kill another thousand people the day after that, um, well, you need to mass produce your missile weapons and clay sling stones is the preferred technology at this time. The last topic we're going to touch on here before we uh, finish up in this area and start zooming in on Anatolia is religion. We talked a bit uh, about warfare in the area. Uh, we talked about some of the technologies being used. Uh, that We talked about uh, how city-states were starting to get this concept of nation-states or at least uh, client-slave states. We talked about how that enabled um, more bodies, more free time for larger armies, uh, but it also enabled more body, more free time for more complex religion. Uh, and we uh, saw at that time the city of Uruk uh, had one of the largest structures uh, ever at the time built, uh, and that's the, the ziggurat or the white temple. Uh, and that's about three meter, 30 meters tall, made out of pure white stone, sitting on a raised plateau that was in the middle of a plains. So you would have seen it everywhere. Now you'd think, um, you know, in our time when we talk about religion, uh, you know, you think about Christianity, we, we've got um, a monotheistic God, we've got one God, we've got Islam, same thing, same God, uh, just a different flavor. We have um, uh, Buddhism, uh, and we've got um, all sorts of other religions, uh, but these religions are everywhere. Millions and in some cases billions of people practice just a few religions. Uh, now there are certainly hundreds of religions around the world, maybe thousands, um, but we've got a few core ones and everybody knows them. Religion in this time was really more of a local thing. You've got um, your city, and in the center of your city is a temple. And when we're in the, the Uruk period, um, which is where that same time frame that our God Emperor of Mankind is born into, in that period, you have a local God, the God of your city. That's the God you pray to. And they may have traders that come in uh, from outside the city. Uh, and they, you know, if you're in, in one of these city-states, 
Uh, you've probably got a little uh, local temple, or at least a little alcove, where you can go in and pray to your local god. But for the most part, everybody in that city worships the god of that city. And there will be um, a central icon or statue or something that physically uh, represents that god, that the god literally inhabits. The temple is the home of the god. That god protects the city, and inside the temple is a vessel in which the god literally lives. So your religion is built around this temple, around this god, and one of the things that happens at this time and in later time periods of this era is when you're the king of Uruk and you take your thousands strong army to the neighboring city and you go to um, uh, them and you beat them down when you go and collect tithes of slaves well the worst thing you can do to that town isn't necessarily to slaughter half the population it's to go into their temple and take their god now if you did that you were probably inviting the wrath of that god and uh, you can imagine the literal fear you might have of your mortal body to go into another temple and take somebody else's god but if you just showed up uh, with a thousand strong army and won the day well you probably think your god was stronger than their god so why wouldn't you go and take their god and show them who's boss well that's pretty motivating if you are the losing city to hand over your tithe of slaves and wheat and grain and material goods you don't want to lose your god because then the plague will come to your town or, or uh, a fire will burn your harvest So in the city of Uruk, where this massive ziggurat temple is, well, that's the biggest god of them all in this period. He's sitting above every other city in the entire world. That's how big these kings are. That's how powerful this god is to those people. Um, and that's how important that god is to these people. Up until this time, a god didn't dominate a region. A god just dominated the city. But once people are able to create armies that are thousands strong and go into neighboring cities and take their gods from them, all they had left was your god. Uh, and it's not to say that there was holy wars that we think of today where uh, we might try to forcibly convert people it was just the mere uh, threat of taking your god that's what happened and so uh, we, we had this concept of gods of cities and there wasn't really um, a hierarchy of gods that we're aware of until one city started dominating another. Once this started happening, one city's gods or god, their patron god, started to become more preeminent than the other. And you can imagine kind of the evolution. Uh, it's just kind of a natural evolution of religion. Much like how 
uh, earlier we were talking about the spread of culture and ideas um, you know when we talked about the spread of uh, linear linear pottery hey I, I like your design of your pottery I'm gonna steal that well as um, your neighboring city comes every year like clockwork for their annual tribute or worse they make you come to their city to deliver the annual tribute you don't have to show up with an army uh, they fear and respect you enough to come to you and bring you the slaves you don't have to go and get them when they come well you can imagine the awe of walking across the plains and seeing the massive white temple rising out uh, of the plains in the distance and the throngs of thousands of people coming to give offerings to the temple to pray for another good season of warfare here's the city that's dominating your city maybe on your way out you're gonna stop at the temple maybe can't hurt to pray to somebody else so you can imagine how this happens over and over and over again over dozens and hundreds of years that there's an evolution of religion a spread of religion of one god in one religion from one city starting to dominate the other in the uh, in the surrounding area much like how your culture comes to dominate the area when you're um, the dominant military power your religion comes to dominate that area your language dominates that area your science dominates that area this is how a singular civilization begins to develop instead of um, every little city sitting in their own vacuum uh, and it's just the people going back and forth trading that are picking up the common language and common ideas once your militarily start to dominate and the neighboring cities are forced to be your clients well that's how another way your civilization spreads and this is even though there's no concept of borders there is only a concept of you're in this city I'm in this city and every year you're under my sphere of influence and you owe me tribute whether that tribute is food or slaves or wealth or goods this is how nation states expand and even though there's no concept of countries even though there's no concept of culture or really a concept of religion uh, there's only the God of the city you're starting to see the influence of one dominant force over the other neighboring less dominant cities in the area Now this is going to be the end of this episode and we've danced around Copper Age Anatolia and we've kind of scratched the surface of what civilization means and, and what other civilizations are in the periphery of Anatolia and we've touched on uh, the story of Otzi, who is an actual person who lived in the Copper Age that we know a hell of a lot about. We're starting uh, to pull all this together in our next episode.
we're going to zoom in our, our magnifying glass or telescope from uh, the world down to kind of the the Mediterranean region and next episode we're zooming in to Anatolia proper and the Copper Age in Anatolia proper and what uh, the world was like for somebody who lived in that region based on what we know about Otzi's life uh, based on what we know about the neighboring civilizations and then we're going to start to pull it all together and paint a picture of a world that has sound, uh, that has taste, that has smell of what was the God Emperor of Mankind's world like. Uh, and then we're going to uh, take another look at the text that's in our Warhammer 40,000 novel that describes the same period and then we're going to see if we can draw any interesting conclusions between the two uh, from what we've done over these past few episodes uh, to what we're going to do in our next episode. So this is the structure that we're taking, this is the journey that we're on. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope it wasn't too boring. Uh, and if you wanted me to go into more detail uh, on anything, uh, please let me know. Uh, my goal in this episode uh, wasn't to get too in the weeds because we want to get to our, our main event, which is really Copper Age Anatolia uh, and the life, the early life of the God Emperor of Mankind. And that's where we're going to go into real detail. Because we've already built the world. We understand what's happening. Uh, we understand how civilizations interact with each other. We understand the spread of culture. And the concept of nation states starting to form. And what that means for the people that live in them. And how religion is developing. Well, next next episode uh, we're gonna get uh, grim dark on Anatolia and what that looks like thank you for listening